<laughs> That's it. You get used to it in this country, subhanAllah. Okay. Everyone here okay? Is the um, mic loud enough? Yeah? Sisters? Who's mic? You didn't get my joke. Who's mic? <laughs> It's Mikael. <laughs> oh man, you turned me up, didn't you? you just... no. All right. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الصلاة والسلام على رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته my dear brothers and sisters. So we've reached a, a sad but happy time, bittersweet. Alhamdulillah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has granted us the means to be able to be here. But subhanAllah, now this time is coming to an end and we have to leave. And some of, some of us, inshallah ta'ala, will return, bi'idhnillah, and some of us will not return. And Allah knows best. I'm going to do a kind of buy one, get one free type lecture today. Unexpected, why? I promised that I would do something especially for my beloved sisters. Huh? Don't worry, I'm not gonna kick you all out. <laughs> and then one of my dear brothers gave me a very good suggestion as to um, a particular topic, Jazakallah khair. He knows who he is. So we're going to do a bit of both, inshallah. Is that okay with everyone? Yeah? No? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, talk to me, guys. It's okay? Yeah, it's fine. Alhamdulillah. Right, okay. She says, I, I forgot my crystal ball, so stop the lot of We're going to start off by, we've talked about Al Anbiya, Alayhim wa Salam. And we're going to talk about some of the amazing women who were behind Al Anbiya. And we're going to start off in the Qur'an, in Surah Al-Imran, Surah number three. So Surah Al-Imran talks about the wife of Imran, who when she wants to do shukr lillah, and what, what faith were these people at the time? What, were they, what faith were they? They weren't Christian, no. They were Jewish, huh? They were Jewish. So the wife of they were Bani Israel. So all these types of people at this time, they're from this background. So the wife of Imran, in a vow of thankfulness, and we've heard about this from Sheikh Saleh on the coach, mashallah, may Allah reward him hugely. She promises to de 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 dedicate her unborn son to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to the temple. This was a very common practice in those days, by the way. But women were not allowed inside the temples. It's actually only even recently that women are allowed inside Orthodox Jewish temples, and still even now women are not allowed inside. And in the majority, they're certainly not allowed to lead. They're certainly not allowed to speak. They are the very much, we think we have segregation. It's really, it's nothing compared to, uh, to how the, um, the Orthodox Jews have segregation. So she wants this, son of hers remember what's in her mind why is a son in her mind when she's making this dedication why has she got a son in her mind why do you think why is she thinking my son because of you okay is it what she wants yeah that's one of the reasons why why is she thinking a son she's dedicating it to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because cultural norms are that only men can go into the temple right so if only men can go into the temple, she's expecting in her mind a cultural expectation, which is I'm gonna be having a boy. What does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala do? He breaks this cultural expectation for more than two reasons, but we're gonna talk about two reasons today. Number one, women do not go inside this temple, but actually, this amazing woman, Hannah alayhi wasalam, she has dedicated 
uh, this child to the temple, she's made a promise, promise to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? So she wants to fulfill this promise. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives her a daughter. And she's like, Allah, you gave me a daughter. What do I do now? She, now she's got the test. This is the second thing. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is giving this woman a massive test. Will she still stick to her promise and have faith in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he will indeed get Maryam alayhi salam accepted into this temple regardless of what her gender is? Or will she give in? This is her only child. Huh? Her only child that she has to give up. What an amazing excuse she would have had, right? Okay, it's a daughter, khalas, I'll keep it at home. I'll keep the girl at home and maybe try again next time, inshallah. So she's being tested by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, a big, big test. So she dedicates this girl to the temple nevertheless. She doesn't know what's going to happen. What happens? Something amazing. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala opens the people's hearts. Zakaria alayhi salam. His heart is open. In fact, it is said by the ulama and in the hadith literature that actually what happens is when Maryam alayhi salam is being offered to this temple, what happens? They're fighting over who will be her wali. Who will be her protector? Huh? Usually, if you've got this cultural interpretation or this cultural thing in your mindset, oh no, this, this is a woman, she can't come in the temple. You're crazy. She's going to be brought up in the temple with alongside the men. What's going to happen? Haram, no way. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala changes hearts. Lesson number three. No matter how high your climb might look, my dear brothers and sisters, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if he chooses to open this door for you and facilitate this, even if it's against all cultural norms, even if it feels to us like a miracle, miracle for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it's nothing. It's easy for Allah. Don't underestimate the power of what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can do. So Maryam alayhi wa salam, she goes into this temple by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, what is Maryam? We are, we are offered the explanation, Maryam alayhi wa salam, she is course of, of course Ummu Isa alayhi salam. All right? She is the mother of the Prophet Jesus, peace be upon him. Huh? What else is she that we not thought, we don't think about? She's a single mother, huh? She brings Isa Aysalam up on her own. If she's been brought up in a temple alongside the ulama of the day, she would definitely have been a woman of deep, deep knowledge. She would have been a scholar as well. You think she was just staying in this mihram all the time? She's gonna, not going to stay in there all the time. She's going to be listening. She's going to be learning. Her iman, her taqwa was very, very strong, as we know. Why? Because when the angel comes to her and says to her, right, okay, you're going to have, you're going to have this child. Instead of freaking, like most sisters would do, probably all sisters would do, freak out. Wow, this guy's coming to attack. What's happening? Her iman, her taqwa, it kicks in. A woman of knowledge, a woman of taqwa, a woman who is chaste. A woman who in a way, and some of the ulama say, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given this woman a type of wahi, a type of communication. She's given some kind of inspiration from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. She's given inspiration to keep quiet and do a vow or a fast of silence when she takes this baby, who as far as the community are concerned is what? Illegitimate. Huh? Imagine this, she comes back to the community. Like, shame on you. What, what, like, what are you doing? You've got this kid. What have you been doing? So instead of having to defend herself, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala defends her with a miracle. If she wasn't a woman of strong iman, a woman of strong taqwa, a, st a woman of knowledge, she would not have been able to do this. She brings up a prophet, Isa Salam, who is one of the greatest prophets, the greatest one, subhanAllah. Apart from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he's the one before. Look at all these Christians here. Huh? 
who are here to follow Isa Salam. SubhanAllah, Allah knows best whether they're following in the right way or the wrong way. That's not for us to judge. Leave this for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to judge. So women are presented by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in different roles, in different forms in the Quran. So just as in the case of Hana alayhi salam, they're presented in different ways in the Quran. Very often we forget to reflect, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tell, tells us in the Quran, Ya tafakkaroon, we should think, we should reflect on the words of Allah. Huh? Why are we given stories? Why are we presented with stories in the Quran? Number one, because as human beings, we take in narrative much better than we, when we, in lectures, it's academic, we're falling asleep, man, it's boring, right? We don't take it in properly. Believe me, if all the lectures in your, your uni course came in the form of like films and stories, we'd all be getting first degrees, right? Because we take in stories much better than we take in um, academic research and academic lectures. Now, mentioned in many of the classical texts, the, uh, the tafsir of the, the Qur'an, there's one particular incident. It's mentioned when um, Umm Salama, anha, and this is at the point that she is the wife of the Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And the women were coming to Umm Salama and they're saying to her, why is it that the Qur'an addresses men directly and not women directly like the guys? Huh? Now, why were they saying this? Let's think back to the uh, to Hana alayhi salam. There was a cultural expectation at the time that the Quran it's just for men. This, these things are just male only. When we look at, especially before Islam came, actually the narrative was very male heavy then. Women were very oppressed. Baby girls were being buried at the time alive. SubhanAllah. But the Quran came along to change this. So the women came to Umm Salama not because they doubted the Quranic text, not because they doubted Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but because they doubted that things would change, because things have been this way for hundreds of years, thousands of years. Why would the mindset of these guys change now? What does this mean, subhanAllah? Umm Salama anha, went to the Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and told him, and talked to him about this. And this is what the sisters are asking. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala responds to this request straight away. And at Dhuhr, on the same day, the Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he receives a revelation. And this is uh, Surah 33, verse 35. You must, brothers and sisters, read the tafsir on this surah. Huh? So it starts off, Bismillah ar-Rahim, in al muslimina wal muslimati wal mu'minina wal mu'minati. Yeah, we know it, mashallah. I can see the brothers and sisters saying it. Huh? So you know the ayah. So this is talking about the Muslim men, the Muslim women. It's doing two things, this verse. Number one, it's confirming to the sisters Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking to you directly as well as talking to the men directly. In fact, from this, the ulama, because Arabic is a binary opposite uh, language, it has masculine and feminine. People who have uh, studied a bit of Arabic, you'll know this. It has masculine and feminine, right? So what happens now is that according to the tafsir, according to the, the ulama, um, when something is masculine and it's also neutral, it's, it's referring to both men and women. Huh? It's referring to both men and women. And this is how we take these um, verses. But when we look at this particular ayah, it's also giving, similar uh, as in Surah Al-Furqan, it's giving criteria. What do we need to do to get Allah's love? What do we need to do to get Jannah, inshallah? So here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Allah has prepared for these people Number one, forgiveness. And number two, ajran azima. A, a big reward. A big reward, subhanAllah. So we see here that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, contrary to uh, cultural norms, responds to the request of women, just like he responds to the confusion of Hannah alayhi salam and gives us Maryam, Umm Musa.
So we can think about different women here. I'm going to skip through this quite quickly, inshallah. So let's have a look at women in certain leadership roles. How does Islam see this? Because usually, well, women can't be leaders of nothing. Just the house and the kids and all the rest of that. The house and the kids is the ahsan place, the, the, the best thing for women to do. But actually in Islam, according to the majority of ulama, eligibility for leadership is based on your qualifications and based on your skills. Huh? So let's ha go back to the Qur'an to look here. We're going to go back to the foundation source. So historically we've shown many women in prominent roles, especially in the early, early generations of the Muslims. The Sahaba, the Tabi'een, we are seeing women scholars and the men and the women would go and learn from these scholars. When Musa, alayhi salam, huh? Musa, alayhi salam, when he is hired, when he gets his work, he is done so not only on the word of a woman, but on his qualification, not on his gender at all. Huh? And here in Surah 28, we see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, one of the two women said, oh my father, hire him for the best one that you can hire is the strong and the trustworthy. So we see this criteria, Musa alayhi salam, he's strong and he is trustworthy. Now, let's look at the hadith literature. Sahih hadith, al-Bukhari. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says um, that, and here we're talking about a particular hadith that talks about uh, leadership, leadership of women. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala provided me with considerable benefit during the, ba the battle of the camel with one word. When the news reached the Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that the Persians had appointed and Khosrow's daughter as their ruler, he said a nation which placed its affairs in the hands of the women will never prosper. So in this particular case, he knows that the, the skills of this particular woman are not going to be successful. This nation is not going to be successful if this woman is at the head. But when we look at the Quran as well, women are presented as leaders in the Quran. Let's look at Bilqis, the queen of Saba. Now, I'm not going to go through the whole story here because it's a very long story. But when we look at the narrative, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and this is when the bird comes back to, to uh, Suleyman alayhi salam, he says, I found a woman ro ruling over the people. She's been giving many blessings and she has a mighty throne. What happens with the throne? Remember the Ifrit? It goes, it gets the throne and it, it brings it to Suleyman alayhi salam. And her skills are... Being, uh, being congratulated by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here. Her blessing is being shown by Allah. What is the problem with the people of Sabah? Can anyone tell me? What's the problem? What's the problem with the people of Sabah? Anyone? The problem is that they are worshipping the sun. They are worshipping the sun. They're committing shirk. Huh? This is the problem that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brings in the Qur'an. Not the gender of their leader. In fact, she's given a compliment. The problem is that she's blessed, but the shirk is an issue. We need to clear the shirk so they can be made clear and clean. There's actually no evidence in the Qur'an and in the Hadith literature that, um, uh, that, that the Queen of Saba actually marries Suleiman a.s. What is the evidence is that she becomes Muslim and when we look at the Quranic language, we look at the Arabic language, it says Ma Suleiman. So she comes alongside Suleiman as a leader and as a Muslim, as a believer. There are so many different stories of women that we can think about. The story of the mother of Musa salam, who is inspired by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to let her child go on the, uh, the river Nile. There are so many different uh, scholars and sisters that we can look at throughout time that we've lost their mm -hmm. stories. We've lost their narratives. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless them hugely. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala enter them into Jannat al-Firdus, inshallah. So now we're going to move on. We're going to talk a little bit about the Yom al Qiyamah. And this is a promise, mashallah, to my dear brother. We haven't got long. 
No, it's okay. You don't need to set your watches for Yom Al-Qiyamah. It's no problem. It's no problem. So what is Yom Al-Qiyamah? Yom, al Yom al -Qiyama. What does Qiyam mean? Qiyam? What do you do? When you boom, you stand up. Yom al -Qiyama, the day of standing. Yom Al-Akhir. Akhir? Last. The last day. Pick up these, but if you, Mashallah, I know many of you know Arabic, but if you pick up some little words, inshallah. Al Yom Al Akhir, the last day. As Sa'a, the hour, the hour or the time. When we look at the word As Sa'a, it refers to an unspecified portion of time. So we can't measure this As Sa'a. It's usually used to refer to an hour in a part of, say, for example, 24 hours in a day or in a week or in a month. Yom al khuruj Subhanallah. Yom al khuruj, khuruj it means the day of coming out. When the earth will throw the people from their graves. People will be in the qabr. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will cause us to be, after we've been regrown, we're going to talk about that shortly, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will cause us to be taken out from the qabr and like a throwing out, like the earth almost, can you imagine that the earth spits you out? And if you've seen these strange films with all these, you know, these zombies coming out from the earth, subhanAllah, Allah knows best, maybe it's something like this, subhanAllah. May Allah protect us and give us the best on the Yom Al-Qiyamah. Al-Qariya, the striking hour. Qurtubi Aisalam mentions the reason for this being, it's striking the hearts with the terror of this day. It's striking the hearts with the terror of this day. So there are many different ways that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us about this day, which shows us how important this day will be. And we need to reflect on this day. We need to think about this, this day, my dear brothers and sisters, because this day is as real. We will be as real on this day as we are sitting here now. It's not we're going to be some soul floating around. The soul would have been put back. Huh? You pinch yourself, you can feel, right? This is what this day will be like. When the sun will be brought to within a mile, some of the ulama say, to within a mile of us, and that people will be sweating. To the point where some people will be drowning in their own sweat. Some people will be to their ankles in their own sweat. SubhanAllah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us from this. And then we have the trumpet blast, a sakha. Looking around, just look around you right now. Look at all this. Look around. Look at this beautiful city, the hills, the struggling we were doing yesterday when we're planting, huh? Subhanallah. All this will be gone. It will be destroyed. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will remove it. It's beyond our imagination to think that none of this will exist anymore. The trumpet, Israfil, the malaika, of course, they have purposes, they have jobs. And the, the task of Israfil is that he is prepared, waiting for the order of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That some of the ulama will say that he is waiting, prepared with the trumpet or horn waiting just there so Allah gives the order bam. nobody knows when this is going to happen Allah knows best the word sur the word sur is translated as trumpet but it also means a horn or like a bugle so when we imagine this it could be in lots of different forms and Allah knows best and we do not know the Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam mentions since the time that he was given this task his eyes are ready, looking towards the throne of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Imagine this. Fearing in case the command is issued before he blinks. 
So he's scared to blink in case he misses the command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, as if his eyes are two bright stars. In another hadith, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam describes the angel has the trumpet near his pursed lips. You know, when you purse to blow a balloon or to uh, or something, subhanAllah. And his head is back, listening for this command to blow this horn, subhanAllah. Allah is enough for us and he is the best disposer of our affairs. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam told us that when this trumpet is blown, it will be blown on a Friday, on a Jummah. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, and this is in a hadith related by Abu Huraira radiallahu the best day on which the, day, the sun has risen is a Friday. On it, Adam salam, was created. On it, he was made to enter paradise and on it, he, he was taken out from paradise. And the last hour will take place on no day other than Yom al Jum'ah, the Friday. And there's another hadith that, which mentions that all creatures except Al Insan, us, and the jinn are waiting on Friday for that day. Remember the creatures they have? a slightly different remit to what we do. I think one of the sisters was asking yesterday when we slaughtered the sheep, like, what happens to the soul of the animals? The animals, the soul will just halas go. Huh? But actually what will happen on Yom al Qiyamah, the animals that are alive, and remember the animals have a different uh, way of uh, seeing things and hearing things. They have a different level of hearing. We know this even for, if anyone likes David Attenborough, we know that animals have a different uh, remit to us. We're very limited in what we can hear, limited in what we can see. The animals can hear the screaming of the people being punished in the grave. SubhanAllah. The animals can hear this. The animals are aware of more than we are. The animals will be brought back on Yom al Qiyamah to witness. If you treated an animal badly, be aware, maybe Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will bring that animal to witness against you on Yom al-Qiyamah. The tongues will speak on Yom al-Qiyamah because we will try to lie and then the tongues will be silenced. So when we walk towards something haram or we put our hands towards something haram, then actually if we try to lie, because we did vulum on our limbs by forcing them to do something which is against what they want. The limbs don't want to sin, by the way. We make them do it. They're separate from us. SubhanAllah. Then they will be bought and they will speak against us on Yom al -Qiyama. So what happens when this trumpet is blown? The majority of ulama are of the opinion that the trumpet will be blown twice that it will be blown twice. The first time, everything on earth will go back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Everything on earth will die. And the second time, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will bring everything back to life again. And this is based on um, a, a verse in the Quran, Surah 39, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and the trumpet will be blown. And all who are in the heavens and all who are on the earth will a swoon away in this faint, this death, subhanAllah. And the second time, the resurrection will come to pass, except him whom Allah wills, then it will be blown a second time and behold, they will be standing. Imagine this by being wakened from a sleep and then suddenly you're standing, confused, naked, barefooted, but we won't be bothered. Allah. We won't care because we will be so terrified on this day. We won't be bothered about shame. We won't be bothered about anything except nafsi, nafsi. The blowing is also in some hadiths mentioned as or referred to as a seha. A seha means the shout, the loud shout. 
and when it's, it's mentioned again in other parts of the Quran where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes the shout of the people who were destroyed by him. SubhanAllah. Some of the scholars, Ibn Taymiyyah, rahimallah, says that the trumpet will be blown three times. So we see a difference of opinion here. Huh? Remember before we were talking about difference of opinion and how that works. A time when it will be blown and all the people will be terrified is the extra time that's added on by Ibn Taymiyyah, rahimallah. And then, of course, the other ones that are mentioned within the Qur'an are in agreement amongst the ulama. And this is actually based on another ay ayah in uh, Surah Al-Naman that says, Remember the day on which the trumpet will be blown and all who are in the heavens and all who are on earth will be terrified except him who Allah wills. So... The fact that it's, the swooning is mentioned in one verse and terror is mentioned in another, it doesn't mean that they won't happen at the same time when the, the trumpet is blown for the first time. Maybe these two things will happen simultaneously. We will be terrified and then swoon. And Allah knows best and we do not know. There are some lengthy hadiths about the trumpet itself and some of the uh, some of the ulama including people like al-bayhaqi rahimallah they, they consider these hadiths to be ba'if to be weak hadiths indeed but the quran clearly says two blasts and that is what we um, we would usually accept the two blasts whether it's with the swooning swooning and the terror or whether it's the three subhanallah may allah accept this inshallah ta'ala so what about the time between the two blows of the trumpet? Huh? We don't really think about that. What will be these times? How will that look? The Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that between the two blowings of the trumpet, there will be arba'een. Arba'een means 40. Now, the people said, oh Abu Huraira, 40 days? And he said, I'm not sure. They said 40 years, because we want detail, right? even though it kind of won't be even relevant. But the human beings, Alin Sam, we just want the detail. He says, I'm not sure. And they said, okay, 40 months. And he said, I'm not sure. Look at the Sahaba, radiya anhum. How humble were they? That if they don't know, they say, we don't know. SubhanAllah. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will send rain down from the sky and they will grow as herbs grow. So. This is referring to when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala resurrects us from the grave. This is before the second blowing of the trumpet. Now, people who are, I think there are some medical people here. And some research suggests that the coccyx, which is the, the, the bones at the bottom, you know this little triangle of bones at the bottom of the spine? Uh, the coccyx is mentioned in the hadith literature that this will be the place where the, uh, the, the human being will grow back from. SubhanAllah, imagine this. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends this rain according to the hadith and the, the bodies will grow back as if like a plant. SubhanAllah, imagine this. It will grow back except like a plant. And in another hadith, the Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa actually describes the coccyx and says this is the part of the man that will not decay, the coccyx. Now we look at even because we think, okay, what about people who've been cremated? What about people from the ancients? But when you look at the research, a lot of medical research has gone into this by various like Muslims and non-Muslim scientists. And the coccyx is the place that it doesn't disappear. Everything else from the body, it will go over hundreds, thousands of years, but the coccyx, subhanAllah, it doesn't. So even burning doesn't destroy the body. In fact, temperatures in modern crematorium, look at this, people try and run away from a qabr, but even if you've been cremated, you can't run away from the qabr. His medical mode there looking at his watch. Oh man, is the sa'a here? Okay, inshallah. <laughs> SubhanAllah. In a modern crematorium, the temperature can reach over 1,000 degrees. SubhanAllah. Yet the skeleton actually survives um, pretty much intact. It's a different type of burning. It doesn't create an ash. And what they do is they actually grind up the skeleton. And that is what the ashes are that are returned to people's families. A lot of people don't know that. 
subhanAllah. When we look at the, in historically, work from uh, people who have been uh, cremated, I guess, in a way by volcanoes, by, by volcanic um, lava, we see that this part of the body remains intact, even though it's been burnt by the lava. How amazing is that, subhanAllah? Look how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala provides us with the dalil, the evidence, the scientific evidence, all the rest of it. It says, look, I'm your Lord and I know best. But okay, you guys need this dalil. You have a lot of fitna there. You go, there it is. Look at it. Yeah, tafakkarun. Reflect. Think about what we're being shown. So the resurrection, new creation with the same soul. So if you had tattoos in this life or if you had, um, for, for the brothers, circumcised, there will be no circumcision when we are resurrected, subhanAllah. We will be resurrected the same as we're born in the first place, but of course as adults, Allah knows and we do not know. In the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and death will come to him from every side, yet he will not die. So one thing that is different with this recreation is that there is no death. We did that already. There is no death. So whatever happens when we're going through Yawm Al-Qiyamah, and we're going through all these tests, which unfortunately we don't have time to talk about today, all the tests of the Akhirah, we're not going to fall off the sirat and die. Like if we fell off a cliff now, khalas, we're probably going to die, right? We're not going to die. There's no death. That's just either the punishment or there is, inshallah, the reward of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We'll start off, finish off with something amazing. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in Surah Yaseen, today, no soul will be wronged in the least. Subhanallah. You will only be repaid for your deeds. A brother, mashallah, was talking to me the other day, one of our brothers here, talking to me the other day, talking about, asking about the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Subhanallah. With our deeds, my dear brothers and sisters, we can but try, we can but strive. But the biggest thing that we have in our hearts is hope in Rabbana. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us all a good life, full of khair and full of barakah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us a good death because indeed we will return sooner or later. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala take us in the best of ways, inshallah. Subhanaka Allahumma wa bihamdika ashadu an la ilaha illa anta wa astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayk. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim wal Asr. Inna al insana la fi khusr illa alladhina aminu wa amilu as salihat wa tawassaw bil haqq wa tawassaw bis sabr. Jazakumullah khair. And I'd like to say just before we leave, um, you know, subhanallah, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make our journeys safe and successful inshallah ta'ala and also i want to really convey my very genuine love for you all for the sake of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala it's been a pleasure meeting you and spending this time alongside my dear brothers and sisters jazakumallah assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh